How rare, here are the three treasures. How rare and wondrous is it to have been born into human life, and now I live it. How rare and wondrous it is to be able to listen to the Buddha Dharma, and now I am able to hear it. If I do not transcend the world of delusion in this life, when will I ever attain spiritual liberation? May I, among, along with the entire Sangha, with sincere heart and mind, rely, rely on that which can be truly relied upon in life, the three treasures. I rely on the Buddha. May I, along with all sentient beings, awaken to the great path with my entire being and discover the highest aspiration, which is to become a Buddha. I rely on the Dharma. May I, along with all sentient beings, deeply reflect on the meaning of the sutras and gain wisdom that is as deep and vast as the ocean. I rely on the Sangha. May I, along with all sentient beings, become one Sangha of life, able to move forward and live with a dynamic spirit that is hindered by nothing. The unsurpassed, deep, and wondrous Dharma, even in millions of kalpas, is extremely difficult to encounter, but now I am able to experience and embrace it. May I come to understand and revere the true meaning of the Tathagatha. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this service. I will forgo my mask as our uh, friend Ellen Goto and my wife Kyoko are about 40 feet from me in this lovely, long Pasadena Buddhist Temple building. This will be our combined Nehane and a pet memorial service. So we're going to dedicate this service to all the pets that we have lost and also to recollecting the great demise of Shakyamuni Buddha about 25 centuries ago. I will uh, begin the service by chanting Shi Shin Rai, uh, which is to affirm our reliance on the Buddha, Dharma, and Songha. I will then uh, begin chanting the Ju Se Ge and ask you to join me for that most uh, beloved sutra passage from the larger sutra on Amida Buddha, the uh, Ju Se Ge. Namo Amida Butsu, 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 Namo Amida Butsu. She shin ke e e e le. No more who she Today, on this occasion of the Nehan A and Pet Memorial Service, the members of the Pasadena Buddhist Temple and our friends reaffirm our reliance upon the three treasures of the truth. We rely upon the Buddha, we rely upon the Dharma, we rely upon the Sangha. Namo Amida Butsu, Namo Amida Butsu, Namo Amida Butsu, Namo Amida Butsu. Now at this time, please join me for the chanting of the Juse Ge, or as you would listen reverently. Busatsu Daimuryo Jukyo Juse Ge 
Gagon cho tegon, hishi mu jodo, shigan hu mandoku, te hu jo shogak, ga o muryo ko, hu in dai te shu, hu tai sho bingu, te hu jo shogak, li yoku jin shonen, Joe Shu Bongyo Shigumu Jodo Isho Tenin Shi Jin Riki and Daiko Usho Mu Taido Shojo Tan Kumyo Kotai Shu Yakunan Kai Hichi Egen Meshi kon mo an, he sokusho akudo, tsudatnden shumon, koto jo manzoku, iolo jippo, nichigatn shu juki, tenko on hugen, ishu kaihodo, kote kudoku ho, Jo o nai shu chu, teppo shi shi ku, ku yo isaya buten, ku soku shu toku hon, gan ne shten jo man, toku i than gai o, nyo buten mu ge chi, tu dat mi hu shou, gan ga ku e liki, Toshi sai shothon shigan ya koka daithen no kondo koku shothen inna to chin yo ke Namandabu 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 Namandabu, Namandabu, Namandabu. Gani shiku doku, Biodo se isai, Do no na ishin, Onjo on la koku. Namanda burmana, namanda burmana, namanda burmana, namanda burmana. Namo amira butsu, namanda butsu, namo amira butsu, namanda butsu, namo amira butsu, namanda butsu. Namo Mirabutsu, Namandabutsu, Namo Mirabutsu, Namandabutsu, Namo Mirabutsu, Namandabutsu. Well, again, good morning. And thank you for joining us for this service. Uh, this is the Pasadena Buddhist Temple's combined Nehane and Pet Memorial Service. Uh, you know, I, I've been a professional minister now for 28 years, and I've been part of the organization for 38 years, something like that. And uh, I also, I've often heard uh, members of our Buddhist Churches of America, Jodo Shinshu Temples, complain that ministers like myself only talk about death. That's not true. However, this morning service has two dedications which are both concerning death, albeit they're a bit different, quite a bit different. Firstly, the passing of the Buddha, which is not a sad event for the Buddha. And secondly, the, the loss of our 
pets, animals that we have been bonded with, which is bad for them and for us. So they're different, but they're both regarding death this morning, the two themes I must allow. So if I may, please uh, first let me say a few words about this being our pet memorial service. I have this just, I just brought one image for me into the Hondo today. If you can see down there, I have a picture of uh, a cat we lost about uh, eight years ago when my son was about, my younger son was about seven. And uh, he drew that picture of her after she, before she passed actually, uh, before we even knew she was sick. She went down quickly like animals often do, like people wish we always could. But I believe that our friends uh, here at the temple, Alan Goto, Kathy Kumagai, Jeannie Toshima have managed to get some images of other people's deceased pets up here on the screen for you. We regret all of their passings. We regret the loss. In this world, you know, people sometimes try to pass off their foolishness as wisdom. However, sometimes our wisdom is misperceived as foolishness. One often hears people make fun of those who care a great deal for their pets, for their dogs, their cats, their parakeets, especially older people like me, tend to be made fun of for this. The older we get, I think, the more in this respect we become childlike. The more we bond with our pets, the more we see them as just like us, the more we see that truth. You know, but people are cold sometimes. It's as if a, wid a widower with a beloved dog they see a widower with a, a beloved dog being so tender with it, and they think he mistakes the dog for a human being, and that's seen as foolish. In truth, loving animals is a sign of wisdom, not foolishness. To truly love animals of other species, dogs, cats, pets, uh, rabbits, parakeets, turtles, to truly love these beings is a deep discernment of the worthiness of all life. To love pets is a deep connectedness and a shared life that we live together with them. It is part of that. Again, it is truly wise to revere the lives of dogs and cats and parakeets and turtles and salamanders that have been our friends, that have been our friends. The Buddha Dharma, our spiritual teaching, is concerned very much with sentient beings. Not just humans, sentient beings. That's any living being, any creature, anything that has feelings, that can feel pleasure or pain. We like pleasure, we don't like pain. We don't want beings to be in pain. Anything that can express kindness or selfishness, that's a sentient being, and we're worried about them. We want them to learn kindness. We want them to live in pleasure and happiness and not suffer. We, living beings, like pleasure and we don't like pain. Buddhists mention suffering, the suffering that hovers over the lives of the unenlightened. The suffering that pertains to the lives of unenlightened persons like myself. Buddhists do mention this because we want to figure out how to discontinue that suffering. We want to learn how to remove the causes of that suffering. We want, to, we want to learn how to counterbalance those causes of suffering with other causes that alleviate the suffering. The Buddha at one point elaborated eight sources of suffering. Now, aren't there more than eight things that make us suffer? Well, of course there are, but the eighth one is like a grab bag category. That's everything that pertains to being a composite being or a biological person. But these seven are, the, that and the other seven are worth reminding ourselves of. So may I again remind you and myself of the eight specific causes of suffering that we believe Shakyamuni Buddha himself outlined. And the first is birth. The second is death. <laughs> we knew that. The third is aging. As I always say, you know that by the time you hit 35. <laughs> if aging isn't a problem for you now, it will be in your mid to late 30s. That slowing down of the metabolism will happen. <laughs> You'll start gaining weight. Eating less and gaining more happens to us all somewhere in the 30s. Almost all of us. Illness is the fourth mentioned cause of suffering. And you know, 
Illness cannot be avoided, but it should be whenever it's possible. That's why I had a mask until just before I started speaking. That's why I went and got one vaccine two weeks ago, and I'll get my second vaccination for COVID-19 next week. That's why I get the flu shot every year. If we can stop illness, let's stop it. But we can't prevent it forever. And there's one illness that we all will eventually suffer, if none other, and that is simply the uh, aging of the organs until they fail. The heart will fail eventually. I only once, I actually, I've told you this before, I think, but I did a deathbed service one time. Someone I didn't know, she had come into town, got sick, or they were from San Jose, I think. Uh, they came and, and were with her for a few minutes, and I got there just after she passed. And the doctor actually wrote on the uh, death certificate, old age. I didn't know you could do that. I thought they had to give a specific disease. And, no, she was 97 and her heart just stopped. That's what we want, you know. <laughs> but no other illness. That illness, we won't cure that illness. But every other illness, let's cure it. COVID, let's cure it. Cancer, let's continue to find these remarkable cures. All the chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases besides lifestyle changes, we need a cure for those things. Cystic fibrosis, no one should have that disease. We want to cure that, but it is a fact we have illnesses. The uh, fifth source of suffering that we might uh, mention here is not getting what you want. It's so frustrating to want something and, and not get it. And going along, sometimes you don't get what you want. I wanted that, and I, the other thing the Buddha mentioned it wasn't not getting what you don't want, which people don't know. It was specifically being in the company of people you don't enjoy. It's always struck me as amusing that Shakyamuni Buddha, the great teachers of the earliest level of tradition, see this as a basic source of suffering, having to hang out with people you don't enjoy being with. It's a fact. Nobody gets along with everybody. <laughs> the uh, seventh form of suffering is what we always uh, are mindful of, which is being separated from those we love by death. It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. And then that grab bag category, which in the sutra says, those difficulties which arise from the fact of being a composite being, which is a bit abstract, and it really is all the hardships that pertain to being a biological person, which is the kind of composite which we are. We are biological persons. Now, I don't have a painting of the great deceased today to show you, but the paintings of the Buddha passing away, you know, he, he uh, it took several weeks for him to pass, and uh, so people were uh, informed, uh, students uh, all around northern India and Afghanistan. And so in the paintings, one thing you'll see is that there are people of various cultural backgrounds dressed differently. That was probably true. A few people probably had time to come from distant locations. Um, you see animals grieving. You see, there's often a, a picture of a, a lion. Where did the lion come from? But he, there he is, he's just on his back, just totally distressed and, and uh, distraught. Uh, animals grieving. You know, I suspect that that's a historical fact. I think the Buddha, like many a deep spiritual person, had a positive influence on animals. And they probably were saddened by his passing. Um, another thing you'll see in the paintings of it is the Buddha himself is serene. Although the Buddha, we think he may have died of amoebic dysentery. He got some bad food. But he lay there on his side. I mean, he did have servants. <laughs> he had people to clean his clothes and his bedding and to bring him a cool towel. But he lay there quite serenely. He was prepared. He was ready. Um, you know, there's specific historical reasons why people die, and there's specific uh, causes why the great founders of the religions each passed away at some point in time. And for Shakyamuni Buddha, it was bad mushrooms. It was eating food that was unfortunately, accidentally, as it happened, contaminated with something, microorganisms, probably amoeba, maybe bacteria contaminated food that was contaminated quite unbeknownst to the blacksmith who gave him the meal. Now, I don't want to be insulting towards Christian tradition, but this is so different when you look at how Christ dies on the cross and how the Buddha simply passes calmly on his right side, facing to the west, surrounded by friends and admirers. Those were, there are historical reasons for that to happen, and there's different opinions as to why those things happened, 
But in, as our traditions develop, it becomes important that this is our image, the Buddha. He did not, he was not tortured. He did not suffer horrible agonies. He simply was one of us. He simply was human and it was time for him to pass. And when he passed, he passed serenely. And this is our exemplar, is an exemplar of someone who just passes to the other side calmly and composedly. This is what we hope for for ourselves as well. And that symbol is important to us, the symbol of the great demise. The Buddha, enlightened people, they aren't torn apart, they aren't tortured, they don't sacrifice themselves for others. Jiri Rita, by giving to others, they are benefited. In benefiting themselves, they must give to others. This is our path, the Buddhist path. Now, Shakyamuni Buddha, like we all will one day, did pass away. He was 80 years old, um, and it was again after eating some dirty mushrooms. He told, the, he told Chanda, the uh, blacksmith that gave him the meal, this is the second best meal of my life. The only better meal he ever had was the rice gruel that gave him the energy to attain enlightenment when he was 35. He had experienced many fulfillments, as Prince Regent Shakyamuni had. He had also been a husband and a father. He had much fulfillment in his life before he turned 80. He was the founder of one of the world's great religions, a religion that includes about a billion people today. Having achieved all that he hoped for, death was the dropping away of limitations. What was holding him back fell away with death. What next? For him? For us? Well, what was next for the Buddha? He wouldn't say. Assumedly, this is because we, unenlightened persons, are starting with misconceptions, misunderstandings, misconceptions of human personhood, misconceptions of what our subjectivity is, of what it is to be a conscious being. We humans have misconceptions about the relationship of the one to the many. This great universal process is us. We aren't separate, but we think we are. We tend to miss that our subjectivity, being conscious of this, is making a contribution to life. We are a contribution. We are one of the ways the universe expresses and knows itself. For example, I am the universe, knowing itself as a 71-year-old man with incipient dementia, mild cardiovascular diseases, and less education than he wished he had. On the other hand, I am just some guy from Fresno. Whatever we think about what our personhood is, what subjectivity is, what it is to be conscious, whatever we think about our role in the universe coming to know itself, whatever we think is wrong, flawed, whatever we think about this life and what it leads to, it's more than that. Whatever you think, it's more than that. Whatever you think life is, it's better than that. The Buddha would not try to describe what was coming for him when he passed, but he told us what's coming for us. Our lives will be what they are. Our new life will be determined by karma, by essentially those actions and activities that were intentional, uh, but not just our intentions. Our future is determined by karma, by meaningful causes, both our karma and the Buddha's. And so if we open our heart to the Buddha's compassion, we are safe. We are very safe. The great teacher Tan Luan, Shinran's favorite teacher, to be honest, he, he lauded his direct teacher Honen a lot, but the guy he quoted was Tan Luan, Don Ron, from uh, 7th century China. And Tan Luan gave this example. He said, you may think your karma is so heavy you're going to fall into some hellish state of existence, but don't forget, your karma is matched with the Buddha. You're riding on the vehicle of the Buddha, the great ship of the Buddha's vow. In that case, it's like taking a great boulder, you know, some of those boulders up on the mountain. You can carry a boulder, you can transmit a boulder from Japan to the United States. You just need a big enough ship to do it. The Buddha's vow is a huge ship, a huge conveyance. Don't worry how heavy your karma is. 
It's not, karma, it's not heavy enough to impede the journey. This was Tan Wan's way of trying to explain that the Buddha's karma is added to our karma so far as our destiny is concerned. After 45 years of being an enlightened teacher at the age of 70, uh, excuse me, 80, at the age of 80, Shakyamuni Buddha, 2,500 years ago, peacefully, confidently passed away, leaving behind tens of thousands of followers, leaving about 500 enlightened followers. He was not a god or a prophet. He was a man who fully realized what all men, women, and children are. Shakyamuni Buddha was not a martyr. Buddhist way, again, is always jiri-vita. In benefiting others, we find we're being benefited. And we must, in order to have any goodness in our life, benefit others. At death, Shakyamuni Buddha was asked, who shall lead us? And he said, the rules of conduct shall lead you. That's what everyone remembers. He said several things. He said, of course, as opposed to establishing a new dictator or chief abbot, he said, be lamps unto yourselves. Roger Corliss used to emphasize that that Sanskrit term could be singular or plural. So you all be lamps unto yourselves, as Roger wanted to interpret it, or you be a lamp unto yourself, as the usual interpretation. Be lamps unto yourselves. It was about 25 centuries ago he passed away. We have had the guidance of astute philosophers, penetrating meditative adepts, gifted liturgy experts over these 25 centuries, deep thinkers, kind, decent teachers in Buddhist tradition. We must learn these teachings and reflect deeply. And then we must, then we must be lamps unto ourselves. The very last thing that the Buddha is said to have said is, when you see the Dharma, you see me. This is not some bland reassurance. People say, my influence will go on to future generations. I don't know about that. I don't know. My children will remember me. Will they have, grand will they have children? Will those kids hear who I was? Will my great-grandchildren know what kind of guy I was? I doubt it. <laughs> People say that to reassure themselves. Or as long as you remember him, he's really not gone. Yes, he is. They're gone or they're not. Remembering him doesn't change that. Those are bland reassurances. When the Buddha said... When you see the Dharma, you see me, it was not a bland reassurance. He meant, this is us. I'm here. I'm always here. I'm not going anywhere. Nothing's going to happen. Shakyamuni Buddha was not giving us some sort of lukewarm comfort, saying, when you see the Dharma, you see me. He really meant, when you see the Dharma, you see me. He totally understood what it meant to be the ultimate truth, the universal process itself. The universe manifests itself fully as enlightened persons, as Buddhas. Only the full discernment of this truth will free us. But we have a sense of it even now, through the Buddha's teachings, through his students' teachings, through this tradition, we have a sense of what this means. I don't know the big secret like the Buddha did. I don't know the transformative truth that Shakyamuni awoken to. But I have inherited the wisdom of Shakyamuni Buddha through his teachings, through the sutras and through the students he ordained and taught, and through the students they ordained and taught. And this does lead eventually to living a way that is free, completely free, pure, wise, beautiful, kind, nurturing. This is the life of a Buddha. I have inherited the Nimbutsu teaching, passed down now from some, for some 23 centuries, or was it 25? I've inherited Shinran's interpretation as clarified by Al Bloom and Ken Tanaka and Dennis Hirota and Kakue Miyagi and Michihiro Tokunaga. I've inherited this teaching, this vision from the Buddha through these teachers, and I get a little part of it and you get a little part of it, too. It's one life we share. It's our life. This land is our land. This life is our life. 
This Buddha is our Buddha. This enlightenment is our enlightenment. We will, you will, I will wake up. We will wake up. And I will, again, steal from T.S. Eliot, who stole from Julian of Norwich the phrase that I love to use with you because I'm telling you, if we follow the Buddha's teachings, if we love our pets, if we love our friends, if we follow the Buddha's teachings in truth, we will come to the point where we know that all will be well and all will be well and every manner of thing will be well. Thank you for observing and participating in this service, the Pasadena Buddhist Temple's Nehane and Pet Memorial Service being prepared here for February 21st of 21, 2021. Thank you for joining us. If you are of a mood to so do, please join me in Gosho and in the closing act of the service, which is to say the Buddha's name a few times. We rely upon the source of limitless wisdom and endless life. Namo Amida Butsu, 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 Namo Amida Butsu. Thank you very much.